Good morning, church family. I hope you're doing well this morning as we gather together for worship. As we come together today, uh, if you're joining us for the first time, we're so glad that you would check us out this morning and that you uh, would carve out the time to worship with us and to learn more about Jesus together. And if you're uh, kind of a part of our church normally, it, it's it's just I'm so thankful for you that you would carve out this time to be together with your church family, even if it is online. And so we're gonna come together this morning in worship. And um, if you've been around our church, you know this has been a heavy week. We've been mourning some losses this week around our church family, uh, as well as just going through some difficult circumstances for some individuals and families, even including ours. Uh, and then there's the, the state of the world being what it is right now. More police shootings, more racial outcry, uh, more mass shootings. Uh, it would be easy to gather and rally around all that's bad uh, and all that's hard. Um, we're not gonna do that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna come together as the people of God and anchor ourselves in the word of God so that we can worship God. That's what we're gonna do. That's the posture. We, we're, we come together as God's people. We come together as people seeking uh, the presence of God and the comfort that comes from being together. And although I would love to be in the room together today, uh, I know some of you are able to do that, but not all of us are. Uh, I, I just believe that God's gonna meet us powerfully. Uh, and before we head into worship, Mark and Trish are going to lead us uh, in, in some worship. And before we do that, I just want to focus uh, our, um, our, our hearts and our minds on the character of God uh, as revealed in the Word. So I'm going to read just a little bit from Psalm 145 as we prepare our hearts to gather together in worship. Here's what it says. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. I just love the, those things being put together. The, the, God is trustworthy in his promises and faithful in all he does, but there will be times where we will fall and we will be bowed down low. And the Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up all those who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them food at their proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways and faithful in all of he does. And I love this part. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him and he hears the cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who will love him, but the, he, the wicked he will destroy. My mouth, I love this last part. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. And that's what we're just posturing ourselves to do. No matter what's going on in the world, no matter even what's happening in my personal life, I'm posturing myself to declare the praises of the Lord this morning. So I'm going to pray and then Mark and Trish will lead us in worship. Lord, we just come before you today acknowledging our need for your presence, acknowledging our need uh, for a touch from heaven. We acknowledge that you are faithful in all of your ways and that you are good. And so we come together to declare the promises of God, to declare the character of God, and, and to experience you today. Jesus, would you uh, just allow us a glimpse, a deeper glimpse of who you are uh, and, and a deeper understanding of who you are so that we might be able to uh, come together, Lord, to heal our hurts and pains and to find ourselves, um, our hearts and mind set right in your presence today. So come and meet us today in worship and in the word and in communion. Uh, we love you, Jesus, and we're so thankful that we get to encounter you today. In your name, be with us. Amen. Morning, Fusion. Just encourage you wherever you're at. Uh, just change your posture a bit. Uh, obviously, we're sitting, but uh, if you would, uh, stand with us uh, as we worship together. The same God who 
who's never late He's working all things out He's working all things out Oh yes, I will lift you high In the lowest valley And yes, I will bless your name Let your love rise. 
rise above every fear Like the sun shaping the shadow In my weakness your glory you come would you meet me here again cause all I want is all you are would you meet me here again I'm not enough unless you For change to come Knowing the battles won For you have never failed me yet Thank you, Jesus hmm. Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faith. 
faithfulness still in your hands this is my confidence you never failed me yet never failed me yet I know the night won't last Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Yes it will, yes it will Jesus you're still part out in faith there's something that you're waiting on God to move just sing out in faith that his promises have never failed they have never failed you and they won't they never will fail you he's faithful
Well, we're gonna take communion together now, so go ahead and grab whatever you need to be able to do that uh, together. It was great to be able to kind of take communion live on Zoom together, uh, and can't wait for us to be able to actually do that in one room under one roof together. Uh, today, we're gonna take communion, and um, we're gonna use this passage here, uh, both for communion as well as for part of the message today. Uh, so in, in John chapter six, Jesus begins to have this discussion with his followers and some of the people who have been kind of gathering around following his ministry. And he starts this conversation about bread from heaven and what the true bread that would feed us, that would nourish us would be like. And this comes after this great miracle of feeding thousands of people. Um, and in, in the Jewish mind, they would have been remembering how God provided bread from heaven while they were wandering around in the desert, this manna that came from heaven. And Jesus comes in the scene and he starts making these claims about himself that he is the true bread that comes from heaven. And you can feel as you're reading this passage, this offense kind of building up as Jesus is making these incredible claims about who he is and about the kind of relationship that we need to have with him if we want to really know God, if we want to experience salvation. And so in the middle of all that, Jesus says this like really shocking thing in verse 53. So 653, Jesus says this, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man, he's talking about himself and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on that last day for my flesh is real food and, um, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. I want to read that part again. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the Father sent me and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And Jesus in this passage is not uh, talking about physically eating him, although uh, he is intentionally being provocative in his language. He's not talking about literally drinking his blood, but he is intentionally pushing the boundary here. So if he's not talking about literally eating him, what does he mean? He's talking about the thing that sustains life. The bread and wine were staples uh, of, of things that sustained life in his day. And so he's using these things saying, look, if you want to experience true life, that is only going to be found in me by turning constantly to me as your source of life, as your source of refreshment, as your source of nourishment. And we know as we zoom out from this story, we know that ultimately Jesus later is gonna talk about how his sacrifice on the cross, him giving his life on the cross, was him giving his flesh and his blood for our forgiveness. And he told them, he gave them these symbols, these communion symbols, bread and wine, and said, whenever you do this, I want you to remember what it is that I have done for you. So today when we take communion, uh, we take the bread and it reminds us of the flesh that was crucified for our sake. And it reminds us that the juice or the wine reminds us of the blood that was shed for our sake. We know that to be true, but as we take communion, I want us to remember that these are symbols that point to the fact that Jesus is our source of eternal life, that everything we need, he has done on the cross and he is in himself. And so when he says like, you have to eat my flesh and you have to drink my blood, he's saying, I want you to turn to me as your source of life. I want you to depend on me as your life source. I want you to depend on me for both your salvation now and your salvation forever. Everything depends on me. So this morning, as you get ready to take communion, I want you just to pause for a second. And I want you first to give thanks to Jesus for giving you new life in him. I want you to give thanks to Jesus because he is your source of life in all things. And I want you to give thanks because we don't contribute anything to this. This is his gift to us. His grace to us is giving himself to us. We just have to show up to the table and say yes to what he puts on offer 
for us. So this morning, I want you to give thanks to God for that. And then I want you to just take a second. And if there is anything right now in your heart where you're turning to, to give you life or to sustain you or to give you hope, I want you just to acknowledge it and just turn your attention back to Jesus. Just shift your gaze from whatever it is that your hope is set in, that your, um, that your, your mind is caught up in, whatever that is, just turn your mind from that over to Jesus right now. And it might just sound as simple as like a, just a confession. Jesus, I recognize I've had my hope set on this. I recognize I've been looking to this as my source of life, but you are the source of life. Go ahead and do that. And then when you're ready, take communion together. All right, church. Well, I just got a couple announcements before I kind of shift my, my focus to the word this morning. First of all, I failed to say it last week, I think, but I just wanted to give a shout out to John Rand uh, and, uh, and the rest of our worship team for the incredible effort that they put in into Easter Sunday and Good Friday. Uh, if for some reason you missed Easter Sunday and Good Friday and what we did, I would encourage you to go and watch it and maybe even share it with a friend. Uh, John just did such a good job compiling the video, so we just want to thank him. And then our and, and Meg doing some editing stuff along that too. And then our worship team sacrificing their time and energy to pull off such a, uh, such an incredible kind of project. Uh, just really, really thankful. So so thank you all for for what you did, and uh, thank you for those of you who shared and invited other people. I know I heard from people both locally and from out of state uh, who were like, "Hey, thank you for what you did." So so man, I, I just know that God used it and planted planted seeds uh, of the gospel. And so I'm really thankful for that. Um, also, just want to let you know about a couple other things. Uh, so first of all, I want to let you know that our youth pastor search is beginning now. We met over the course of the last couple of days with a staffing firm, kind of profiling exactly what we want this position to be and the kind of person we're looking for. Uh, and I am just pumped for what the future holds for us. So, so excited to begin to dream about what God is going to do among our students, our middle school and our high school students. And so uh, just super excited about that. And I would just encourage you right now, if you're a praying person, to go ahead and start praying for this person that's going to come so uh, that, that God would begin to guide them to us. I really believe that God is going to send somebody our way who feels called to what we're doing here at Fusion. Uh, and, and so I'm excited for that and just ask you to continue to be praying about that. And then lastly, uh, exciting announcement here. Uh, so starting May 16th, we are going to be moving our services back to Sunday evenings at 4 p.m. outside. Uh, we will probably be at Messiah in the parking lot like we were for a couple months last summer. We'll be doing that from mid-May, so May 16th, I believe it is, through about mid-June. And then we're going to see what the next steps are after that. And so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just great to know that we're going to see everybody kind of in one place once again really soon. Uh, so I want to encourage you just to begin to prepare your heart for, for being together with other people. I think it's going to be an awesome time of celebration. So we've got uh, some exciting things on the horizon as we begin to gather back together. Uh, so make that, uh, kind of circle it on your calendar. We're going to make that shift from morning back to evening uh, for at least four weeks, and then we'll see exactly where we go from there. But we won't be going back to doing this, at least I hope not, uh, after, after that. And so just want to let you know that that's coming up, and we'll give you more details coming up soon. So uh, there it is. All right, let's dive into the Word. So I was going to kind of really launch into um, a series on kind of the power of our words, and I'm going to touch on that today. 
uh, but actually just given everything that was going on uh, this week, I just felt a slightly different direction that I needed to at least start with uh, and then land talking about the power of our words. And so, uh, so I want to take just a slightly different direction. We'll pick back up with what my plan was uh, next week. But here is where I want us to go today. Uh, I, I want us to think about where do we go uh, for our source of life? Just kind of like I already talked about in communion, but a slightly different way to think about it. So just after this passage that I read, where Jesus is having this exchange with people about his, um, uh, about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, he begins to unpack that even a little bit more. So just a couple verses down in verse 60. So six, uh, so John 6, 60, here's what it says. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life and the flesh counts for nothing, but the words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. There are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time on, many of his disciples turned their back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe that and to know that you are the Holy One of God. I'm going to pray and then we're going to dive in. So Lord, I'm here today in humility offering uh, your word to your people. Not my word to my people, but your word to your people. So Spirit of God, come and breathe on your word today. Let it truly bring life to us. Help us to grasp what you have to say today. In Jesus' name, amen. So here here we have this moment where Jesus is saying these things that are clearly offensive. Uh, The disciples say it right out loud. This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And then Jesus like doubles down on what he's saying. So rather than kind of like try to walk it back and make it a little bit more palatable for people, which by the way, Jesus never does. Jesus never uh, kind of says something, throws it out there, and then tries to make it easier for us to comprehend. He never does that in the Bible. He doesn't do it now. He presents it to us, and it is sometimes very offensive. And that is what happens to the disciples. It offends them so that just a couple verses later, they, they, many of the disciples walk away. They walk away. So why is this so offensive? Why are the disciples so put off by this? Well, one, Jesus is making as clear a claim as he ever could about his true identity. He is making a claim that he is speaking the very words of God. And not just speaking on God's behalf, but the thing that he's speaking, it's from God's mouth himself. It's nothing less than a claim to be the very son of God, to be God himself. So Jesus doesn't leave any wiggle room here for people to be confused about who he is. He is making a claim to be God. And for the the Jewish people, this is an absolute and utter offense. For a man to claim, a person flesh and bone to, to claim to be Yahweh, the great I am, the creator of all things, the one who spoke the word into the world into existence, for, for someone to claim to be that God is blasphemy, absolute blasphemy. It's, it's a curse and affront to God. You're actually, in their mind, pulling down the image of who God is by claiming that a mere, a mere man, a mortal person would be God. But Jesus is making it really clear he is much more than just a human being. And so he says this and it's offensive. So on the the one hand, it's this claim to be God. And then on the other hand, he's talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. This is cannibalism. And while I really think that most people knew that Jesus was uh, talking figuratively about this, he's using a metaphor. 
uh, there was, it was so offensive, the metaphor that he was using to even refer to eating himself, to, uh, to, uh, to this cannibalistic idea. It was absolutely blasphemous. Again, this was like the worst thing that you could do. Uh, most of the Jewish folks were, were not allowed to even come in contact with dead human flesh, uh, not even allowed to come in contact with human blood. So to talk about eating flesh and drinking blood, this was Jesus pushing the boundary about as far as he could push it. They were offended by it. And they're more than, I think, offended by it because they don't just like get angry. They turn and they walk away. Those who were following him stopped following him, many, and then turned and went back home. And I think that that point can be really missed on us and I don't want us to miss it. We're looking at people who had left behind their livelihood, left behind their family, uh, probably sacrificed a great deal because they believed that Jesus was someone special, someone unique. And so here they are following this Jesus like on this road and watching him do all of these things. And all of a sudden he starts making these claims that are just a bridge too far. They're just, just a little bit more than what they, they can handle. There's, in their mind, I, I'm going to guess that, that they, were, they were feeling like there's no way this person can be the Messiah because the Messiah would never make these claims. They would never say these kinds of things. They would never talk about eating their flesh and drinking their blood. There's no way that Jesus could be who he says he is. And so in disappointment, in disillusionment, they go home. In frustration about the, uh, the, uh, their disappointment about who they thought Jesus was, and who he actually is turning out to be, they go home defeated. And so this is an absolute turning point in the life of Jesus and his disciples and his ministry where many people leave and go home. I think it's hard for us to imagine that because for most of us, following Jesus hasn't cost us leaving our home and our family. For some of you, that's true. But I think that we can all identify in different ways with times that we were found ourselves disappointed with something, some expectation that we had about God or about what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. That I know I have certainly experienced that. I, I thought that following Jesus was going to mean X, Y, Z. And X, Y, Z didn't happen. And so I find myself frustrated and disillusioned with Jesus. And my guess is that you have found that same thing. Maybe it was an unanswered prayer, or maybe it was a situation that didn't turn out to, to be the way you thought it would. Maybe you thought when you said yes to Jesus, your, your temptations that you experienced would immediately go away. Uh, maybe you uh, are, are, are disappointed about the family members who don't follow Jesus. Who, 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 I don't know what it might be for you, but my guess is if you have followed Jesus for any length of time, you have found yourself at some point in time disappointed. I didn't think it was going to turn out this way. I thought it was going to go this way. And maybe you haven't been tempted to totally walk away. Many people have. Many people have come to those kinds of places and it's been a total shipwreck for their faith. That did happen to me at one point in time in my life. Um, and I know for many of you, it, it has as well. Um, but, but maybe it hasn't been that, but maybe it's just been that time where it just leaves you lost and confused. That uh, I just don't know what to do with this. I, 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 don't know, I don't know how to get past this. I had this, this expectation, this hope in something, and it's not working out the way I thought it would. I think Jesus, he's so kind, <laughs> He, he, he's so kind here because he turns to his disciples here in this passage, the, those who are left, and he says, do you want to leave too? And I don't think that there was an accusation there. I don't think that was a rebuke. I actually think that Jesus was giving them an opportunity to say, look, I'm not going to force you to stay. If you want to go, go. You know, God's love is relentless in pursuing us. But there's this element where he allows us to, to hold fast to him or to let go when we want to go. Uh, that's hard for me to wrap my, my mind around, but he gives them this invitation to say, look, if you want to go, now's the time. Now's the time. But it's the kindness of God, I think, to recognize, yeah, this is, this is hard. <laughs> 
So it's not that Jesus is indifferent to this hard teaching that he gives to the disciples. It's not as though he doesn't realize that what, what has happened here, what's transpired and what he's just said, it, it isn't difficult to kind of uh, stomach. He knows that. And actually, I think that Jesus, uh, the, the portrait that we get of Jesus is somebody who is so fully God, but so fully human. And so identifies with the pain that we experience as human beings and these moments of confusion. It's why Jesus weeps at the death of his friend Lazarus and seeing a crowd of people gathered around mourning the loss of his friend, even though he knows what the outcome is going to be, the compassion of Jesus to grieve over a friend who he knows this is not going to end in death. I think what a, what a kind God to know and identify with our pain and know, I see that you're hurting and I see that right now you might want to run. And rather than say, don't you do it, how dare you? To say, here's your, here's your chance. But this next little exchange is just so beautiful. Peter says these words, says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where else would we go, Jesus? Yes, we're confused by what you're saying. Yes, we're, we're, we're totally overwhelmed by this. And uh, uh, we're watching our friends who were all following us leave and go back home. We're totally overwhelmed by this, Jesus. Like we, we don't know what to do, but where would we go? In the next line, he says this, we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So we, we know who you are, Jesus. So we can't go anywhere. We know that you have what we need, even if we don't understand it. <laughs> even if everything around, around us kind of pushes against and tests our faith and belief in that, we know it to be true. So where else would we go, Jesus? Yeah, it would be tempting to run and go and hide, but right now, we know that you are that source of life. And over and over again in this passage, Jesus is revealing himself as the one who brings the words of life to us that we need. And that is where I want us to kind of just land here for just a minute. I want to recognize that regardless of what we feel, regardless of what has happened, regardless of what is around us, that Jesus is the source of life. His word is the source of life. There is nowhere else we can go to get what we need. So maybe for you, um, you've never had a moment in time where you've ever thought about completely walking away from your faith. That's good. And I want to say that is also normal. I don't want to celebrate uh, the deconstruction that's happening in the world right now as though that that is a good thing that we, we, we should be going, yay, that's great. Walk away from your faith. I don't think that's God's heart at all. <laughs> I don't think that's what that that's what he what he wants for us. I think for most of us, it's more of a temptation to turn to other things and other people for comfort rather than to turn to Jesus in a moment where we need comfort. I know that that is my temptation. <laughs> It might be something as simple as I want to snack and eat my box of Oreos, or it might be, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Uh, It might be that I'm turning to other kinds of things for comfort. All of that, there are some of those things that are totally fine. But at the end of the day, Jesus is the source of life. All those things will make us feel comfortable in a moment. We need that. We need the the warm blanket, the, the cuddle from a friend, all the human creature comforts that we can possibly get. But at the end of the day, Jesus is our source of life. He is what he has to say, what what he has to say in his word that we read, what what he has to say in his very life and the life he lived, and what he has to say to us even now, speaking directly to us, because we believe that God speaks to us in moments of time. That is our source of life, and there's nowhere else we can go to get it. There's nowhere else that we can go to get what we need. And so we come to these points in life where we get to choose, what will we do? Will we depend on the the comforts that the world would provide? Will we walk away like some of these disciples do? Or will we turn to Jesus right now as the source of life? Right now, there's so much going on in the world that it would be easy to say, just to throw up our hands and say, forget all of this. 
But if we look at the state of the world, both the things that are happening big picture, the racial injustice, the police shootings, the mass shootings in facilities, the conflict and the, the COVID and all of these things, at the end of the day, Jesus is the only answer to any of that to all of the big picture things and in all the small things, the small disappointments and the pains and the frustrations that we have, the words that Jesus has are the only thing that will fix all of it. It's the only thing that will bring us comfort and it's the only thing, the good news of Jesus is the only thing that will actually set the world the way it is. And any attempt to, uh, to actually bring healing and wholeness to the world outside of Jesus as the source of life is ultimately going to fail. And if it's going to fail on a grand scale, it's certainly going to fail in my life. And I've just learned through the years and along with other believers to, uh, to that, that when I am in a place of desperation, when I am in a place where I, God, this is hard and I don't understand that I've got to be like Peter and say, where else would I go, Jesus? I, I'm not, I might not even be happy about it, but I know that you are the source of life. So I want, to, I want us to lean in and realize that Jesus is the word of life. He is the source of life. And there is nowhere else we can go to find what we need, no matter how tempt tempting it might be, no matter how difficult it might be. Then this last thing, and this is the last part. This is just kind of a short word today. I want us to recognize the importance of our words in declaring this. It's not enough that Peter believes this in his heart. But he actually makes this declaration. I, it's such a clear declaration. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. See, I think that there's power. Actually, I know that there's power. And we're going to dig into this over the course of the next couple of weeks. There is power in what we say with our mouth out loud. <laughs> And I'm coming to believe this more and more that, that actually I need to say out loud what it is I believe, even if I'm having a hard time believing it. There are times in life and difficulties that we, that, that we face where I, I can feel the whole situation shift. Maybe not necessarily having the outcome that I want, but having my, my heart posture, the climate of my emotions and my spirit. The whole thing shifts with a declaration of what I believe to be true about God. Do you know it's scientifically proven that our words actually have an effect on living things around us? When we, there, um, there's all kinds of studies, you guys can go out there and find them, where people speaking negative words to plants can cause plants to not grow as well as people speaking positive words to plants. God, now we can look at that and say, oh, that's some new age kind of stuff. But I believe that God has given us as human beings the power of the spoken word to bring life into situations or to bring death. The Bible actually says that we have the power of life and death in our tongue. We're going to unpack that a little bit more. And so in situations where we find ourselves, where we're backed up against a wall, where we don't know what's happening, actually there is there is incredible power in speaking life and speaking words of declaration and hope, even in the midst of despair. And this way, it almost sounds to me like Peter, like it's not a shout. It's not like a, yes, God, you are so good. Yes, Jesus, you're so awesome. It actually sounds like a, a plea of desperation, like Jesus, where the heck else would we go? You, all of our friends have left and everyone has gone and we're so confused by what you're saying, but we know it's true. We know who you are. So Jesus, we declare it. We, I believe it. We know it to be true. You are the Messiah, though you are the one who has eternal life in your words. And so church, I want us to lean into that a little bit. I want uh, for you personally and for us as a church, when we are going through difficult and hard seasons, when something is not going the way that we thought, when the world seems like it's crumbling around us or the whole globe feels like it's falling apart, that we actually posture ourselves in faith and declare what we know to be true, even if we don't feel it to be true in a moment. Even if we don't have all of the theology worked out, you know, Peter was still confused about who Jesus was all the way up till, until he died and then after he died. It's not until Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, talks to him and after he's denied Jesus, 
and turned away from Jesus and restores him back to health. It's not until after then and the power of the Holy Spirit that it finally clicks for Peter and he knows exactly what it is that he confessed with his mouth. And actually, I think there's something really powerful. Like sometimes we think that we have to have all the pieces put together in order to confess something with our mouth. And it's the opposite. Actually, I think sometimes we have to confess what we have a conviction about, even if we don't fully understand it. And later on, God will give us the understanding, the revelation to grapple with it and understand it and apply it. We see that over and over and over in Scripture. And so in the middle of difficult circumstances, we have to make a declaration of what we know to be true, even if it feels contradictory, even if it, even if it, if, if it doesn't, all the pieces don't fit together. Actually, over the course of the last few weeks, there's been uh, many opportunities I've had to pray with people, uh, and, and at least three occasions, I was able to pray with people and actually speak healing over people. And on three occasions, within just a matter of minutes, we, I saw notable change in praying for people and what God was going to happen to say. Now, I don't think there's any magic in my words. It's his power and its authority. I'm declaring what is to be true. And there are times where that doesn't happen. There are times when we pray those kinds of prayers and it doesn't work out the way, the way that we want. But I'm going to err on the side of believing in God's goodness every single time. I'm going to err on the side of believing in God's compassion every chance I get. I'm going to err on the side, on the side of, of, of declaring that every, every time. So I want to encourage you to do the same. Wherever you are, whatever you might be going through today, whether you're overwhelmed by what's happening in the world or whether it's something happening with you personally, or even if that's not the case, maybe you're coming this morning and you've got, you're full of joy. You're full of excitement. Like you, you, you are, you're not overwhelmed in any way. That is awesome. So I don't want to put you in a category to say, you know, make you feel isolated and alone. I think that's great. But I think all of us together can declare what we know to be true, that Jesus is the source of life, that his words are life, that no one else has what we need. I think sometimes that confession in a moment, even if it, even if it doesn't change instantaneously, actually affects kind of the way and the duration of which we walk through something, how we walk through something. I think that moment of confession, that declaration of who God is, actually can shift the atmosphere of our heart, can shift the atmosphere in the room that we're in, can shift the climate of the people that we're around. And if we as a church declare the praises of God, it says what that's what we're supposed to be in 1 Peter, that we are a people who are chosen, a royal priesthood, to declare the praises of God. If we would do that, if we would lift up our voices and say, we know that Jesus is the source of life, if we would do that, I think it would change our culture around us. It would change our neighborhoods. It would change our community if we confess what we believe. And so today I want to encourage you to do that. I want you to take a little bit of time, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever you're feeling today, and just make some out loud declarations about the character and the nature of God. To make some out loud declarations about what you believe to be true about Jesus. And so maybe that might look like going to one of your favorite psalms, like the psalm I read today, 145, I believe it was, and, and, and reading that psalm out loud. That's what I do sometimes. Sometimes I, when, I'm in a, when I'm in a pit, when I, when I don't understand something, I'll just pick a psalm and I just read that psalm out loud. I'll say it out loud because when I say it out loud, it gets into my spirit. Maybe it's reading a passage about who Jesus is, the compassionate one, the merciful one, the powerful one, and just reading that out and saying, Jesus, yeah, that's who you are. That's who you are. I want to encourage you, however you can do that today, to make those declarations. Maybe it's just something where you're going back in the past, you're remembering the ways that God showed up and healed, the ways that God answered a prayer. And you're saying, you know what? I know, God, that you're that kind of God. You did it before. You will do it again. Like the song we said today, God, I, I, God I've seen you do it, and I know that you can do it again. Sometimes that's what that declaration looks like. And it might not sound like a confident cry. It might not sound like you're raising your voice this powerful kind of thing. It might sound like, Jesus, where else would we go? I think those whispers are just as powerful as those loud shouts. Jesus isn't interested in how emotional you are with it. He's not interested in how with the display or the eloquence of it. He's interested in your true confession of who he is. Just like Peter said. 
I'm going to pray for you. Pray for us. Jesus, I pray that today that you would do something in our hearts that causes us to declare the praises of you. God, that, that we, we acknowledge you as the source of life and we turn our eyes and our hearts away from anything else other than you as our source of life. You as the source of eternal life. So Jesus, I pray that you would pour out your spirit on us so that we would declare your praises so that we would prophetically speak to the dry bones in our life and in our culture and our families and our neighborhood and say, rise up and see, the, see God for who he really is. Come, Holy Spirit, and bring the word of Jesus down into the depths of our souls so that we might know who you really are today and raise us up to be the people that you've called us to be, a people of hope, a people of joy, a people of compassion, a people of mercy. God, this is what you want to do among us and in our midst. I declare it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a great week.